And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. There is a popular saying credited to a one-time president of the United States of America. The saying goes, Ask not for what your country can do for you. Ask for what you can do for your country. This saying was made in the inaugural speech of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, most popularly known as J.F. Kennedy. He was the 35th president of the United States of America. The saying resonates with time and keeps the memory of J.F. Kennedy constantly green in the hearts of people around the world till today. He was a charismatic leader who was elected at the age of 43. He remains still dead the youngest person that ever clinched the presidency of the United States of America. But the sad part of his story is that he was assassinated at his prime on 22nd day of November 1963 in downtown Dallas, Texas. In this edition of Back in History, we bring to you the story of the gruesome assassination of President Jeff Kennedy by a man who was also assassinated by another man as an expression of anger over the audacious assassination of a president whom the majority of American citizens loved. Welcome to this edition of Back in History. On January 20, 1961, John F. Kennedy was sworn in as the 35th President of the United States of America to serve for a four-year term. He went on with his work and became a popular president at home and abroad. Three years into his administration, and as it is the case with many politicians, John F. Kennedy began to tour America and in a way present himself to the people as someone who would seek a re-election in the forthcoming presidential race. John F. Kennedy proceeded to Dallas, Texas to meet with the people there. At that time, there was friction with some of the president's party men in Dallas and the president planned to meet with them during the visit and broker settlement. The president's visit was thus highly anticipated, with thousands of people across party lines trooping out to the roads to give him a rousing welcome. The president arrived in Dallas, Texas with his wife Jackie Kennedy, together with security personnel, some staff of the White House, journalists, and many others. On touching down from Air Force One, the president and his entourage joined a motorcade to cruise by land and meet with people in places already scheduled. John Kennedy was such a free person and highly cherished president that he had no inclination that he could be harmed on the American soil. So he was driven through the streets of Dallas in an open roof limousine with no protective covers around the vehicle. His movement around Dallas was widely publicized in the local media and the routes to be taken by the president were known to everyone several days before his arrival. With full knowledge of his movement, it turned out that it was easy for a sniper to plan and execute an attack on the president. This is exactly what took place. As the president's motorcade was driving through the street in his open roof limousine, he was greeted by a jubilant crowd, and the president returned the appreciation by also waving at the crowd. It was such a joyous moment that everyone in the limousine was seen smiling and also waving at the crowd. In this jubilant mood, there was danger ahead of the motorcade. A sniper was somewhere close by not far from the president's motorcade. The sniper had arrived before the president and had taken a strategic position and had also measured his shooting range to be sure that he would not miss the targets. There was a public library by the road with many floors 
and the sniper checked into the library with his rifle neatly concealed and went up to the sixth floor of the library and took a strategic position by the window. That way, he could hit any target on the road without having to kill many people. It was a carefully planned strategy by the sniper and his strategy came as a surprise to the security operatives. As the president's motorcade drew closer to the library, with chairs from both sides of the road and the president responding happily to the chairs and waving his hand, the sniper struck at exactly 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time and hit the president on the back with the bullet passing through the president's throat. He fired another shot and then a third shot to the head of the president. The president collapsed into the vehicle with blood and parts of his head pulling out and splashing on the vehicle and on the wife of the president who was just beside the husband. Her clothes were soaked with blood, so also were the clothes of the president. Something horrific had just occurred in downtown Dallas, Texas, on the soil of the United States of America. John F. Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States of America and the charismatic leader of America, was in a critical condition and his chances of survival, even to the non-medical eye, was disturbingly slim. The president was immediately driven to Parkland Hospital in Dallas for emergency medical attention. The doctors on duty in collaboration with other medical personnel battled assiduously to save the president's life. But exactly 30 minutes later, the president was pronounced dead. The shots were so devastating that no human being could be expected to survive. His body was folded up in medical clothes as it is a practice when someone is pronounced dead and rolled away from the theater. The president's wife was so devastated. It is reported that soon after the president was pronounced dead, the wife removed her wedding ring from her left finger and placed it on the chest of her deceased husband. A dark cloud had engulfed America. Several questions were thrown up in the circumstance, such as, who will break the news to the world? How was it to be broken? When and where? What then happens to the seat of power in Washington? What if the assassination was part of a calculated plan to seize power in Washington? This, and many more, with equations that agitated the minds of the security personnel and the assistant press secretary, all of whom were in the president's entourage to Dallas, Texas. But the decisions needed to be taken. After some consultation with Washington, the news of the president's death was first broken in Dallas to a handful of journalists by the president's assistant press secretary, Malcolm Kildoff. John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. Slow it down. I have no other details regarding the assassination of the president. The news was then broken to a wider audience by Walter Cronkite of the CBS. Walter, who was a regular face on CBS, is reported to have emotionally adjusted his glasses and few seconds after, he slowly removed the glasses to check the time on the wall while blinking back in tears and making the sad announcement to the American people and to the world. It was a devastating news to the American people and also devastating news to the wider part of the world. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson was in the president's entourage to Dallas, Texas. And in fact, his car was barely two cars behind the president's car 
when the assassin struck. There was initial anxiety about his safety, but it turned out that he was safe as he was not the target of the hitman. The vice president thus needed to be taken on board Air Force One and sworn in as the new president of the United States of America. He entered Air Force One and took a position on board the plane, and the swearing-in was immediately done by Judge Sarah Hodges, who was a judge in Dallas, and the photograph of the swearing-in on board Air Force One shows Mrs. Jackie Kennedy standing beside Lyndon Johnson in her blood-stained dress watching emotionally the swearing-in of Lyndon Johnson. The swearing-in was in such a hurry that Lyndon Johnson took the oath of office using a Roman Catholic Missal, a daily prayer book for Catholics, taken from President Kennedy's desk, despite Lyndon Johnson not being a Catholic. Lyndon simply mistook the Missal for a Bible, but the ceremony was performed. Lyndon Johnson thus became the 36th president of the United States of America, occasioned by the unfortunate circumstance of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It has been reported that it was too emotional to put the president's casket in the luggage section of the plane. So the decision was taken to, to collapse some seats inside Air Force One and place the president's remains respectfully on board the plane. He was then flown back to Washington and the following day, arrangements were made for his funeral. The funeral was planned by Army Major General Philip C. Welly, who was the commanding general of the military district of Washington, and retired Army Colonel Paul Miller, who was the chief of ceremonies and special events in the district of Washington. The late president's body was taken for autopsy at Bethesda Naval Hospital, and thereafter, the body was prepared for funeral by embalmers from Gola's funeral home in Washington. The body was then returned to the White House on Saturday, November 23, where the body lay in repose in the East Room for 24 hours and guarded by troops from the 3rd Infantry and from the Army Special Forces. At the request of Mrs. Kennedy, two Catholic priests also stood by John Kennedy's body in the East Room till daybreak. On Sunday, November 24, 1963, Kennedy's coffin was carried on a horse-drawn caisson to the United States Capitol, where he was laid in state. Throughout the day and night, hundreds and thousands of American residents and visitors to America lined up to view the casket as a mark of their last respect for the president they truly loved. On Monday, November 25, 1963, Kennedy's coffin was taken into St. Matthew's Catholic Cathedral for Requiem Mass. The Mass was celebrated by the Archbishop of Boston, Richard Cardinal Cushing. Kennedy was a devout Catholic from birth and kept the Catholic faith till the time of his assassination. His funeral was attended by several persons including representatives of more than 90 countries across the world. This included French Prime Minister Charles de Gaulle, Canadian Prime Minister Lester Pearson, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, who represented his wife Queen Elizabeth, British Prime Minister Sir Alec Douglas Home, Irish President Eamon de Valera, and Ethiopian Emperor Hel Selassie, and many others. It is reported that approximately one million people lined the route of the funeral procession from the Capitol back to the White House, then to St. Matthew's Cathedral, and finally to Arlington National Cemetery. Millions more followed the funeral on television from across the globe. Kennedy was buried at Arlington National Cemetery just outside Washington, Virginia. Kennedy was 43 years old when he became the President of the United States of America and as noted earlier till today, he remains the youngest person in the history of America to be elected as president. The man who assassinated JF Kennedy was known as Lee Oswald. 
Soon after the assassination, he was arrested by the police and detained for murder. On the morning of November 24, 1963, while being transferred from a jail cell to an interrogation office, the unexpected happened. Oswald was shot by Jack Robbie, who was a well-known nightclub owner in Dallas, Texas. Jack Robbie later told the press that he did not want Mrs. Kennedy to be traumatized watching the trial of Lee Oswald, the killer of her husband, hence his decision to eliminate him without much ado. Oswald died from the bullet injuries and Jack Robbie was charged to court and convicted for murder. Jack Robbie later died in prison. Kennedy was born into a prominent family in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. The Kennedy family remains to date one of the most established political families in the history of the United States of America, having produced a president, three senators, three ambassadors, and multiple other representatives and politicians, both at the federal and at the state level. John Kennedy attended Harvard University and graduated in 1940. He served in the U.S. Naval Reserve and fought in the Second World War. He had a stint in journalism and later joined politics. He won election into the United States House of Representatives, where he served from 1947 to 1953. He was subsequently elected to the U.S. Senate, where he served as senator representing Massachusetts from 1953 to 1960. Kennedy attained the peak of his political career when he won election as the President of the United States of America and as the youngest person to attend such feats. He was loved by people across party lines and his assassination remains a sad reminder to date. Kennedy was married to Jackie Kennedy. They were married a year after Kennedy was elected as senator. They were such an amiable and glamorous first couple. Their marriage was blessed with two surviving children. The name John Fitzgerald Kennedy, popularly known as J.F. Kennedy, continues to resonate around the globe till today, despite being eliminated at his prime by the assassin's bullets. Thank you for watching this edition of Back in History and do remember to subscribe to the channel for regular notifications.